do for others, it's kind of, wow, it's surprising we hit there so fast. But today we begin in the second chapter of Ephesians. And just as a bit of review, chapter one, as normal uh, for the Apostle Paul, we have an introduction. This is Paul. This is writing to the Ephesians, grace and peace to you. But then Paul goes off into listing some spiritual blessings that we have from God through Jesus Christ. And it's almost like he just, he, he, it's off to the races. He's already, he's already getting into it. And, and it, seems, uh, it, it seems quite fast. He just kind of goes, man, we are so blessed through Jesus Christ. It is like he is bubbling with praise and he cannot contain himself. He says, we've been chosen, we've been predestined to adoption, we've been redeemed by Jesus' death on the cross, sealed by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And then Paul thanks God for the vibrant faith of the Ephesian believers. And to encourage them, Paul tells them how he prays for them. And this is a wonderful bit of insight into the heart of a pastor for his people. What does a pastor desire in the people he shepherds? He prays that they would grow more that they would know more about God so that they can grow more in their faith. And then chapter two begins the main body of this letter to the Ephesians. The first chapter is full of theological language. It was simply, it was simply a prelude, however, to the rest of the book. And in our passage this morning, Paul provides a detailed description of salvation. Now, I know you're sitting here thinking, wait a second, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, didn't he already talk about salvation? I mean, hasn't he, been, hasn't he been detailing that? Hasn't he been describing it? And yes, he has. But I think this is another indication, another point, another data point of how focused on the gospel Paul is. The gospel in Paul's mind is not just something, okay, we did it once and we'll just put it off to the side. The gospel was always on his mind. It was something that he highly prized and valued, and it was something, it was a truth that was never far from his heart. And so if we as Christians are always talking about the gospel, and we ought to, we would be very Pauline. We'd be very much like the Apostle Paul. Paul already gave us a lengthy description of salvation, but chapter 2 is a bit different from chapter 1. Chapter 1 presents salvation from God's point of view. Paul is saying, look at how much we've been blessed by God in Christ. And so it's very much, this is what's going on behind the scenes. Paul, in chapter 1, kind of describes salvation from a backstage notes. You know, when you go and you watch a play or a musical or something, there are all these like backstage notes, okay, move the prop here, move here. It's a behind-the-scenes look at what is going on in salvation. But chapter 2 focuses from a different point of view. Chapter 2 really describes salvation from a human point of view. What is it that you went through? What is it that I went through? What is it that we experienced? And so this is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It describes every Christian's testimony. Now, just a few minutes ago, you heard that uh, next Sunday, or a week from today, we're going to have our members meeting. And one of the things that we do in members meeting is we hear member testimonies. And it's a wonderful time where we get to hear, hey, this is what God has done in this person's life. And in case you're interested in reading it ahead of time and getting the full unabridged version, they are posted in the hallway outside these doors with a picture so that you know who it is, <laughs> that is uh, the, whose testimony it is, okay? And this, our passage, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, is basically every Christian's testimony in a nutshell. Now, of course, the details differ, right? The time and the setting and the specific context differ. But this is, in a nutshell, what happens when someone comes to Jesus Christ. And we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, but for today, we're only going to be focusing on verses 1 to 7. But follow along with me as I read Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. It says, And you were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As a whole, this passage outlines our salvation. And for this reason, I've just entitled the passage, our sermon, Rescued by Grace. And these 10 verses can be subdivided into three sections, and we'll cover the first two today. The first, the first act is a hopeless situation, a hopeless situation. Situation. And then in verses four to seven, Paul describes a wonderful God. And then finally, in verses eight to 10, our glorious salvation, which is, as I said before, next week. So let's go ahead and look at verses one to three, where it describes a hopeless situation. Verses one to three, sorry. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, if you, as, you, as you read these verses, it would be natural to think, well, what a downer. I mean, what a way to start a letter. How how depressing is this? It's not a description that we would long for. This is certainly not going on anyone's tombstone. This is not a description that is desirable. But let's break it down, and, and let's understand why does Paul say this, and what implications does it have for us today? Verse 1 starts with the most sobering description of all. It says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins. You were dead. Paul is describing our former spiritual condition by way of illustration. And we understand that death is the absence of life. You were lifeless. You were dead. And specifically, you were without spiritual life. You had no spiritual pulse. You were spiritually dead. Now, how do you know that someone is dead? Besides taking someone's pulse, usually you might poke someone to check if they're still alive, right? You know, sometimes you see people sleeping. Sometimes they're so still, you wonder if they're still alive. So maybe you go over there and pinch their nose. They wake up, look at you, and go, what in the world, man? Right? Or maybe you just kind of poke them, prod them. Oh, they moved. Okay, so we know they're still alive. And this is especially true when you've got, you know, uh, sometimes you're talking to older folks. I remember uh, my grandfather used to spend hours upon hours sitting in front of the television watching Price is Right. And uh, my grandfather, I didn't know. Uh, I, I didn't understand it was sleep apnea at the time, but he would stop breathing. And of course, I'm sitting there watching and wondering how in the world he could watch this for so long. And I'm looking over like, I, I, don't, I don't hear him breathing. So of course, I go over and I just poke him and he, oh, oh, and then turns the channel to a different channel. But this is the, this is the reality, right? 
When you are spiritually, when you are dead, you don't respond to inputs. You don't respond when you're poked and you're prodded. You're unresponsive. You lack a pulse. You are dead. A dead person would never respond. A dead person is incapable of responding to stimuli. And so when verse 1 describes our previous condition as being spiritually dead, it means that we were unable to respond to any spiritual stimuli. If we were moved or emotionally touched in the past, it may not have reached the level of our soul. This verse adds that not only were we dead, we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And the word for trespass is describing a misstep. It is heading in the wrong direction. And the word, in contrast for sin, describes missing a mark or falling short of some sort of standard. Now, when we think about trespasses and sin, one way to think about it is these are sins of commission. We do what was prohibited, or sins of omission when we don't obey completely. In other words, we have committed acts of disobedience. We have disobeyed God, but also, even if we attempt obedience, it is partial. It is incomplete. It is unsatisfactory. And that's what it looks like to be dead in sin. But second, in verse, in verse 2, it continues because, you know, it's not depressing enough. Slaves to sin. We were slaves to sin. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In describing our lifestyle, verse 2 says that we once walked, we walked in these trespasses and sins. And whenever the Bible says walk, it's talking about the characteristic manner of life. This is what typified, this is what characterized, this is what would describe your lifestyle. It's not a one-time thing. We don't walk one time. We, we take step, 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 step. We walk. This is what your behavior was like. And verse 2 identifies our life direction, that we were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, these three phrases describe a spiritual direction. It says that we were under the influence of this world, that we followed the devil and his lies. And as a result, we were characterized by our disobedience, which is why we are called sons of disobedience. We are so disobedient that we are children of disobedience. We are sons of disobedience. John, Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 34, that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. In other words, habitual practice of sin is addicting. It is addicting. Those who regularly engage in it are addicted to it. And to top things off, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the consequence for every sin is death. Whether the sin is great or small, whether the sin is visible or invisible, whether people catch you doing it, or whether only God sees it, the wages of sin is death. But third, as if it couldn't get worse, it says that we are condemned because of our sin. We are condemned because of our sin. Verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Notice this is not a description of them. It's a description of us. And it is applicable to all of humanity B.C., before Christ. And the first two phrases in verse 3 carry, refer to passions and desires. It says that we lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. In other words, before Christ, we lived for ourselves. We may not have had a physical one, but we had a mental crown that we put on our head, saying that we are kings. 
we are queen. We are, we are rulers. We are sovereign. We get to decide. We have the liberty and the freedom to choose whatever we want to do, however we want to do it, whenever we decide. We are rulers. We are miniature kings, queens, sovereigns. And we exercise our sovereignty based on what we want to do. So if I feel like doing something, I will go and do it because I am the ruler. Before Christ, we lived for ourselves. We did what we wanted. We oriented our lives around the fulfillment of our desires. We lived to please ourselves. Now, I'm going to pause here because some of you are thinking, wait a second. So is this life about reversing that? So let's just seek to deny ourselves every privilege and every pleasure. If we are uncomfortable, let us make ourselves more uncomfortable. Well, that, you would, that leads to asceticism. You might as well go join a, a monastery or convent. Deprive yourself of everything. That, that, that is one way to think about it. That is how some people have responded historically. And I think, I think that's problematic. Rather, what this is saying is that we lived for ourselves and purely for ourselves without any regard with, to what God would want. We only ask ourselves what we want and we pursue what we want. Whether God okays it or not, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't even register. It doesn't, inf it doesn't affect us. It does not compute because we're spiritually dead and we're walking in this way. But for those of us who are in Christ, we realize that that crown that we used to wear is fake, that it's destroyed, that it's imaginary, that there's only one ruler. He is God in heaven. And so as we live, we ask, would my actions, would my desires, would, would what I pursue honor God. Verse 3 says that we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And this is a reference to our intrinsic nature, our default inclination towards sin. We are sinners by nature and by action. We are by nature children of wrath because we deserve God's wrath because of our sins against him. Romans 5.12 reinforces this idea when it says, sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And this is also known as the doctrine of original sin or inherited sin. Because of our ancestor Adam, sin has infected the entire human race. And Jesus was not tainted, of course, because he was born of a virgin, which is why the virgin birth is actually important. Now, in bringing this up, I know that you may have more questions. You may, you know, buck against or, you know, uh, object to this idea of inherited sin. And I understand. I have my qualms. I have my reservations as well. But feel free to talk to me about them afterwards. But let me continue, because this argument that I just referred to in Romans 5 also continues. Romans 5 continues. And in verse 18, Paul writes, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, and he says this, he says this as this is true, right? As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. In other words, if we have all been condemned through Adam's actions, then many have been redeemed through Jesus' actions. Death through one, life through another. And so if we think that it is unfair for all of mankind to be condemned through one man's actions, then it would be equally unfair for us that we would be saved by one man's actions. In summary, our previous condition before Christ is described as being spiritually dead, unresponsive to spiritual input, incapable of responding, that we were trapped and enslaved to our sins and trespasses, that we were under the influence of this world and the devil, that we lived to fulfill our own passions and desires without any regard to what God would desire, and lastly, that we were condemned by God's wrath for our sins. 
No. A few weeks ago, I preached a challenging message about the doctrine of unconditional election. And in it, I offered Wayne Grudem's definition of unconditional election, which reads, election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Now, when we consider the description of our hopeless condition before Christ in verses 1 to 3, God's choice based on his sovereign good pleasure makes more sense to us. If we were spiritually dead, how could we have any merit in us? If we were enslaved to our sins and trespasses, following our desires and mired in disobedience, what could possibly entice God to save us? What makes us savable, save-worthy, salvation-worthy? Sin has tainted every part of the human condition. It has corrupted our thinking, our desires, our emotions, and our actions. And while God's common grace upon all of mankind restrains people from being as sinful as they could potentially be, God's common grace does not save. It is only his special grace. Our sins were heavy and we needed rescue, and it's a rescue that could only come from a wonderful God. Because God acts in our hopeless condition. Look with me at verses 4 to 7. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In light of the depressing condition that I described in verses 1 to 3, one should ask, well, what can be done about such a situation? Is there any hope? What is the end of the story? If that's it, well, then let's just forget about it and move on with life and pretend we didn't know. If there is no hope. But the, verse, the first two words in verse 4 announce some of the greatest news that we could possibly ever hear. But... God, but God. God intervenes. God shows up. God does something. He does something. He acts. He intervenes. He does something about our hopeless condition. He does not just let it stay that way. He does not just say, well, too bad. He doesn't just wipe his hands and say, well, stinks to be them. (laughs) You win some, you lose some. Oh, I guess in this case, you lose all. (laughs) God acts. He does something. And how does he do it? First, he redeems because of his mercy and love. He redeems because of his mercy and love. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Why would God intervene? Why would he interject? Why would he insert himself? Why would he do something about this situation? Why not just let us go? He would be perfectly righteous to do that, right? For the wages of sin is death. His Verse 4 tells us that God acts out of his mercy and love. His actions, his decision to intervene, flow from his character of mercy and love. He is rich in mercy and he shows mercy. He is loving and so he shows love. God did not reach out to save hopeless sinners because he was obligated to do it. There is no obligation. He chooses to. God chose to save. And he did it because he loves us and he desired to show mercy to us. And now specifically, what what did God do? What did he do? He made us alive in Christ. He made us alive in Christ. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Notice, Paul's repeating himself, and it hasn't been that long. I mean, we're in verse what? We're in verse 5 and verse 1. He already said we're spiritually dead. Stop it already, you know? It's kind of like, and you were dead, and you were dead, and you were dead. It's similar to like the child who goes, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's like to remind us over and over again, you were spiritually dead. You were spiritually dead. You were spiritually dead. But God. But God. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he what? He made us alive in Christ. And this is a manifestation of God's power and sovereignty over all of creation. To make someone alive in Christ is something that must be done to that person by someone outside, by an external entity. God had to intervene, and God had to make you alive. It is something that only he can do. Now, under the cover of darkness, you remember Nicodemus, right? A member of the Pharisees. He approached Jesus, and he, 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 was, he, wanted, he was genuinely curious and interested in what Jesus was teaching. He wanted to understand, okay, Jesus, you're teaching these things. You're going out and around the, the nation of Israel. You're becoming more popular, and there's a whole lot of disagreement about what you're saying, and we're not really sure. Can you explain it to me? And Nicodemus asks Jesus about what he was teaching, And Jesus said to Nicodemus, John 3, verses 3 to 6, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In saying that you must be born again, Jesus is just reminding us that it's not in you. You cannot save yourself. You must be born again. And notice Nicodemus says, can one enter into the womb of his mother again? He's still thinking, well, can, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, no, you can't. You must be born again. Someone must do that to you. Someone must make you alive in Christ. You can't just bring yourself back to life. Jesus highlights the impossibility of self-salvation. But verse 6 continues and reminds us that not only does this wonderful God redeem us, out of his mercy and love. Not only does he make us alive in Christ, but he unites us to Christ. He unites us to Christ. We have a special connection to Jesus Christ as believers who have been redeemed by his blood. Verse six, that God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have a special connection to Jesus Christ because we have been bought purchased, redeemed by him. And this repeated phrase is with him, right? In the future, God has promised us a place with him in heaven. John 14, Jesus told his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Jesus is reminding the disciples in John 14, In the future, you will be with me in heaven. That the glory of salvation is not just that we are rescued from hell. It is not just that we, that our eternal destination has been changed from hell and rerouted to heaven. It is that we will be with Jesus. That we will be with Christ. And for those of us who long for him, this is wonderful news. Not just to know your Savior and be saved by your Savior, but to be with your Savior. And this is why when when Paul talks in other, when he writes in other places, he says, well, you know, what do I do? Should I stay here or should I leave? 
I know that to depart, I would be with Christ. To leave this life, I would be with Christ. And that is far better. That is better by far. The only way someone can speak that way is because he truly longs to be with his Savior, Jesus. Jesus is not just the instrument by which we are saved. He is also one of the greatest hopes that we have and what we would look forward to in heaven, having fellowship with him. Verse 4 tells us who God is, that he's rich in mercy and he loves us deeply. Verses 5 to 6 tell us what God has done, that he has made us alive in Christ. And now verse 7 tells us why God has done all of this. Why has he done this? Why did God act? Why did he enter into our world? Why did he inject himself, send his one and only son? Why? He has saved us to what? To magnify his grace. To magnify his grace. That's the so that. So that. In order that. For the purpose that, so that in the coming ages, verse 7, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God has engineered and arranged salvation to highlight, to draw attention to, to put a spotlight on the immeasurable riches of his grace. Now, to our human minds, it can be difficult for us sometimes to, to wrap our heads around certain concepts. We, we often need quantity. For example, if someone were to walk up to you on the street and say, you know, uh, I'm wealthy. First of all, you go like, wow, okay, too much information. What, what are we on, hidden camera? Will you expect me to beg you for money? I mean, what, what, what is this? What do you want? What, what, why are you telling me this? But you know, over the course of your conversation, you might ask, you know, you say you're wealthy. What do you mean by that? Or... You say you're, you're good at golf. I mean, how good? Right? Oftentimes, our human minds fail to, fail to place how, uh, uh, the measure of something. You say you're wealthy. How wealthy? Wealthy as in, you know, you have, you know, you have food on your table. You have a house over your head. You are considered wealthy, wealthy because compared to most of the world, our country, generally speaking, is wealthy, wealthy because you collect Ferraris, wealthy, wealthy because you have estates with wings and planes with wings. W what do you mean by that? You say you're good at golf and you were like scratch golfer, pro golfer, Hall of Fame golfer. Oh, you taught Tiger Woods. Oh, okay. Right? We struggle to, to kind of understand, well, you say it, it's like glorious, it's amazing, it's great. What do you mean by that? And a similar concept, when it, it's a similar concept when it comes to grace. God's gracious. How gracious? How gracious? He's tremendously gracious. How gracious? He's, he's so gracious beyond our understanding. What does that look like? God would just, if, you, if, you, if God were to tell you, I am gracious and loving, I'm abounding in mercy, and you were to ask God, help me understand what that means, God would just go this. Say, what, what, what are you wearing? You're wearing a cross around your neck. What do you think that is? You see the cross on our building? Cross on the bumper stickers? What do you think that is? The cross is the representation of God's grace. You want to know how gracious? God says, look at the cross. Look at what I have done through Jesus Christ. God is so gracious that he reaches out to save people by giving them life. God is so gracious that he saves rebels by sending his son to die on their behalf. God is so gracious that he adopts his enemies into his family at the cost of his one and only son. 
That is how gracious he is. Now, which one of us would ever sacrifice a child for an enemy? That is God's grace. So when we say God is gracious, we shouldn't just use it as our Christianese vocabulary. You know, grace, loving, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, God, Bible, Jesus. We, we shouldn't just, just think about it in that way. We should actually take the time to consider what the cross we wear around our necks mean. What it really costs. That it is beyond our comprehension, beyond our capacity to show that kind of love. Because if you sacrifice one of your children for an enemy, you might think child protective services better be on the speed dial. What kind of person are you? But God, rich in mercy, abounding in love, made us alive in Christ. He rescued and redeemed us when we have disobeyed him. When we have done things that deserve his judgment. And he does it to show us his grace. This is the story of the gospel. It presents us with a hopeless situation, a hopeless condition, and then introduces a wonderful God. So what are some take-home applications for us as believers today? Well, first, it really just kind of goes through the points. Recognize the hopelessness of our situation without Christ. First glance, you might wonder why in the world I'd put this in as an application. I mean, haven't we had enough bad news this year, or for the past 24 months for that matter? But we call the message of the gospel the good news. And the reason it is the good news is because it is a proclamation of salvation. It is a message of redemption, reconciliation, justification, and adoption. It is a message of hope. It promises, it promises hope for the hopeless, rescue for the lost, forgiveness for the offender, a declaration of righteousness for the guilty, and adoption for the orphan. But for some people, the good news of the gospel is not good news. To some people, Christianity just sounds entirely unattractive. I mean, you got to follow a bunch of rules. You got to wake up early on a Sunday morning to come out and listen to a lecture from an ancient document written thousands of years ago. Christianity condemns things that everyone seems to accept while endorsing things that everyone considers passé. And I would say that one of the reasons people don't view the gospel as the good news is because they don't know the hopelessness of their condition. Being without Christ, they would reason, it's, it's not such a bad thing. You got your Jesus, I got my Buddha. You got your Jesus, I got a rosary bead. It's not a big deal. And here are a couple ways that we can fall short in our gospel conversations with people. Number one, or even, even minimizing the good news, the goodness of the good news, is, is when we minimize the sinfulness of sin. One of the ways that we can err is by minimizing the sinfulness of sin. By thinking to ourselves, well, sin's not that bad. Everybody does it. It's not, I mean, it's bad, but it's like not that, that bad. It's just a white lie. It's a half truth. And yet there are real problems with minimizing the sinfulness of sin. Because when you minimize the sinfulness of sin, you devalue the death of Jesus on the cross. If your sin ain't that bad, G then God has definitely overpaid through Jesus Christ. God got ripped off. He didn't, he didn't need to really send and sacrifice his only son. I mean, 
That's like, that's like paying $100,000 at a $1 store. Second way that we can sometimes downgrade the goodness of the good news is by minimizing the wrath of God against sin. To kind of say that, well, hell's not really for everyone. Hell's just for the super bad. You know, it's like the, it's the high, it's the super max. Hell is for the supermax kind of sinners. Not like the low-level offenders. Not for the, the people who commit misdemeanors. I mean, come on. After all, we worship a God of love, mercy, and tolerance. But just as minimizing the sinfulness of sin undervalues or devalues the death of Jesus Christ, Minimizing the wrath of God against sin downgrades his holiness. God is okay with 98%. As long as you beat the curve, right? God shouldn't be so uptight about all of this. And we're human beings after all. But these two things, the way that we think about it, even in the way that we talk about our salvation, it, it tends to lead towards Christianity and the gospel is about an upgrade, not salvation. Right? It'd be like going, well, look, I was on this plane flight. Apparently, they oversold, they overbooked. So I got, I got bumped up to first class on a cross, you know, trans-Pacific trans flight. <sighs> I'm living it. It's lovely. It's wonderful. I got bumped up. But I was in no danger of never making it there. It's just how I was going to go, whether I was going to go in coach or whether I was going to go in first class. But that's not salvation. That's just like an upgrade. That's like getting a, a, free, a free side of fries with your meal. Well, that's wonderful, but you weren't going to starve. Salvation properly understood is rescue from hell. Second application for this morning is to recognize the greatness of God's grace in Christ. Again, to recognize the sinfulness of sin helps us to recognize the greatness of God's grace. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The huge chasm between our sinfulness and God's holiness can only be bridged by the immeasurable riches of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Just consider the greatness of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Consider even the vocabulary of how it is spoken of, of how it is described. Deliverance from danger to safety, from hell to heaven, adoption from an outcast to a family member, redemption, the purchase with Christ's blood, reconciliation, meaning that something was broken and something had to be mended, restoration of a broken relationship, justification, the exoneration of guilt because of Jesus, that God legally declares us righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross. This is the glory and the grace of the gospel, and this is what makes it so good. And sometimes we forget. In how we talk to other people, and how we think about it internally, sometimes we forget. On April 15th, 1912, four days into her maiden voyage, the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg and sank. More than 1,500 people lost their lives in that tragic accident. And in the aftermath of the sinking, people have analyzed and scrutinized the situation, asking themselves how in the world so many people could have perished. What went wrong? Historians tell us that in the final count, there were 472 unoccupied seats in the lifeboats unoccupied. There were seats that were just there, and they were not taken. In fact, the first lifeboat, the first lifeboat 
to be lowered and to leave the Titanic sinking, the sinking Titanic, had only 28 people on it. 28. And the capacity was 65. 28 out of 65. There were 37 available seats. Yet it is believed that the reason so few people were on that first lifeboat is that the passengers did not believe that they were in imminent danger. They had been taught the Titanic was unsinkable. They were wearing life jackets. And even if bad, something bad happened, they reasoned that the ship was so large that it would take a long time for it to sink and that there would be time, time of plenty for them to be rescued. Unfortunately, wearing a life jacket doesn't save you from freezing to death. And it is estimated that most people succumbed to the freezing water temperatures within five minutes of touching the water. Now, for those who were saved from the Titanic, I'm sure that they were so grateful and so thankful for having been saved. They believed that they were in enough danger to depart from a beautiful and elegant ship to a Spartan and functional lifeboat. And when they look upon that lifeboat, they are reminded of their salvation from the freezing waters and from death by drowning. But for any of this to happen, these passengers first had to be convinced that the danger was real and that salvation was available. Church, this is the message we need to tell people. This is the message we need to internalize. This is the message we need to remind ourselves of. We should never downplay the seriousness of the situation. And neither should we downplay the wonder of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. Tim Keller puts it this way, says the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared to hope. Our sins really are that condemnable. They really are offensive to God. They really do warrant death and, dest and a destination of hell. But our Savior Jesus really can rescue. He really does offer to save us. And this is the glory of the good news in the gospel. This is the story of being rescued by grace. Let me pray for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the reminders. We thank you for the reminders from your word this morning of how dire the situation was and yet how deep and abundant your grace was through Jesus Christ. You are a wonderful and mighty Savior. You are a God who intervenes, who reaches to save. And we thank you and we worship you. We give glory and honor and praise to you as those who have been saved by the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.